We are starting a new series on healing, and I, I tell you, we've been preparing for this for like months, it seems like, and uh, this is why I'm excited. It's because uh, today we're going to kind of intro the sermon, and then next week we're actually going to do a Q&A. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to get really attentive to what's going on, and I want you to tweet out questions to us that we're going to answer next week. And so that way, if you get them to us early, uh, we'll prepare for them a little better. Now, next week, we'll take live ones as well. And you've seen Megan and I do this quite often in this service. We're, we're both up here, and we're kind of doing this Q&A, bouncing back and forth. And so I'm very excited about it because the subject is so huge and so frustrating at times because we have questions like, does God still do any healings? Or is that stuff just in Scripture? Like, does God still work? Does he still do? I mean, people like rise from the dead, blind see, lame men walk. I mean, does God still do that? And if God still does that, why doesn't he do it all the time that I think he should do it? Right? I mean, we, we've seen people that we know, that we love, that we care about, who we've seen pass away and die when we think, God, God if you were ever going to show up, this would have been the moment, right? And for those of you that are new, you, you've heard me uh, you haven't heard me, but everybody else has heard me share a little bit about our frustration when my sister passed away. Right? And it's like, God, why didn't you show up then? Where was your healing power then? And we have all kinds of questions like, God, if, is there a connection between sin and my, my, my health? Or do people get sick because they've sinned? Like, do you punish people because they were bad and therefore like they're sick and now that's why we get sick because I've heard that rumor. And so the questions are, 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 are numerous that we could ask. And today, one of our goals is to like take you to the water and just say, hey, here's a huge stream to drink from. But really to, to kind of whet your appetite. You see how I did it? We took you to the water and we whet your appetite. I know. Thank you. And so our goal today would be that we, we've taken you into the conversation of healing. And then we're going to invite you next week to join in the conversation in a new way besides just tweeting out the comments and actually ask us and then we're going to attempt to respond. But here's the only thing I promise you. When you go into a conversation about healing and you start talking about the behaviors of God and the Holy Spirit, here's what I want you to know. Sometimes we don't have answers. And here's the only promise we give you is that we won't... Make up answers that the Holy Spirit doesn't give us. All right? So if we don't know, and there are a lot of questions that I ask around healing that I don't have answers for. And so we just claim, like, I, I don't get it either. And we're just going to celebrate and sometimes even grieve the mystery of God at those moments. Okay? And so, so kind of be thinking as we're going through the sermon... And we'll kind of track some of those questions. And, of course, we always invite you to tweet out. And those of you that are watching online uh, right now live, or maybe it's Tuesday and Wednesday and you're watching on the YouTube channel, again, we would love to hear your questions as well. And thank you for tuning in with us as well, especially all our firemen who are watching online. All right. And so we're going to jump right into it today. Our new series on healing, uh, the hashtag is uh, hashtag the healing 16. Uh, and so this is the way this works. We're in Luke 5. If you got your e-vice, you want to join us there, Luke 5. If you're new, we, we have trouble uh, with the lighting, controlling it so that we can get enough lighting to read the scripture and yet get the, the kind of ambiance that we're aiming for. So we invite you to use your e-vice. And that's a, a word that I made up a while ago, and, and we live with it around here. Uh, but that's your phone, your iPad, your uh, Zoom, your tablet, whatever you've got, all right? And so we're in Luke 5. And it looks like this. Jesus uh, one day is teaching to the crowd, all right? And, and there, he's at a house. And it says this. One of the days while Jesus was teaching, some proud religious law keepers and teachers of the law were sitting by him. They had come from every town and every country around Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And basically when you get that phrase together, that means pretty much the whole area, all right? And it says the power of the whole Lord was there to heal them. The power of the Lord was there to heal them. And that's a fascinating sentence that we may be able to touch on next week. And I really wanted to sit here for a while, but we just didn't have time. But I just want you to hear that for a second, because it is fascinating to know that the power of the Lord can be somewhere. The power of the Lord can be somewhere 
to cause healing. It says, some men took a man who was not able to move his body, meaning he was paralyzed. So they got a guy who was paralyzed, and he was carried on a bed. Now, when you hear, hear the word bed, don't think like they had the, the beds like you and I do, where they each grab kind of a post corner and we're trucking him down the street all right it's more like uh, what you might see any of you that are old enough or you're demented like my family and your parents have subjected you to the mash all right how they kind of had the cots with the sticks and they're carrying the wounded around that's kind of the best description i can give you okay and so they're carrying around this dude in a cot right and it says that they carried him to see jesus and when they looked for a way to get him into the house because jesus is in a house all right there was no way to get him in now again, Jesus in a house, uh, uh, at Jesus' time, you're probably talking somewhere between maybe 20 and 35 people at the max, okay? Not like a big room like this. We're talking a small house. And there's probably people outside of what either might have been windows. It may not have had windows, but definitely outside the doorway, kind of a crowd trying to listen in to hear any of the words he has to say. And anytime you get to teachers of the law and all these Pharisees there, you know something exciting is going on. Like, hey, this is the main event. Okay, because they didn't have YouTube, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have any celebrities, okay, uh, online that you could watch. And so this was it, all right? And so Jesus is there teaching. It says, but they couldn't find a way to get him inside because so many people were there. Then they made a hole in the roof, and I love it, all right? And then Jesus' time, the roofs were flat, all right? And you could go up on the roof, and it was actually the guest room. There was usually stairs from the outside to get up there, as, as well as maybe stairs from the inside, but probably only stairs from the outside. And so they take the guy up the stairs on the outside in the flat part of the roof, and then they dig a hole in the roof. Now, again, it's not a roof like you and me where we have the houses that have kind of this apex, all right, so the snow falls off. These were flat roofs. It was often the guest room. You often had plants and, and stuff up there. And so they dig a hole in the roof, and then they lower the man who was paralyzed on a mat down through the hole in the roof to Jesus in the room. Which I think is just an awesome scene to have in your head, right? Like, can you imagine you're Jesus and all of a sudden you're like, oh, stuff in my hair. And all of a sudden, like, there's a big hole and I go, there, there, dude, hey, what's up? Thanks for joining the party. Talk about a guy who was crowd surfing, right? It's, the first, it's biblical. It's the first account of crowd surfing right there. Didn't know it was in the Bible, did you, all right? And then Jesus makes a statement that is absolutely fascinating. All right? So Jesus just has a sick dude lowered down. Okay? And he says, when he saw, when he saw their faith, whose faith? Is it the faith of the paralyzed man? No. When Jesus saw their faith, the faith of his friends, he said to the man, friend, you're healed. Get up and walk. Right? No, he doesn't do that, does he? It's like we're cruising along, and we all know, see the movie, we all see how it works. Jesus is there talking, and all of a sudden they drop a dude from the ceiling, and we're like, oh, I know the end of the story. Jesus is about to heal that dude, right? And then Jesus gets up, and everybody's like, oh, he's going to heal him. And then Jesus makes a statement, and it's like train wreck car, pivot to the right immediately, no turn signal. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. What? Surprise ending! Right? Jesus is like, whoa! Didn't see that one coming, right? Obviously, I'm more excited about it than some of you are. It's okay. Listen, listen. If we're going to talk about a sermon of healing and do the entire series on healing, this is the place we had to start. All right? Because listen, listen, listen. We're not giving these excuses today. We're explaining something that's very important. Jesus always prioritizes the eternal over the temporary. Let me say that again. Jesus always prioritizes the eternal over the temporary. Now, some of you have your phones out, and you're going, you know, every Sunday I see some people tweet, and I'm not sure what they tweet about. This would be the, the, the tweetable moment. All right? And so if you're a Twitter fanatic or you're on Facebook, this would be the one to put out. Jesus always prioritizes the eternal over the the temporary. You know, as he says to the man, instead of healing the physical, he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. You know why he says that? Because your bodies are wearing out. Right? You know that? Your bodies are literally disintegrating on you. 
All right? And so Jesus looks at the man and he goes, you know what, a part of you is going to be forever. And I'm going to heal that part first because the rest of you is temporary. The body is temporary. And Jesus always prioritizes the eternal over the temporary. Listen, listen, listen. If you were fruit in God's refrigerator, you'd have an expiration date on you. Yeah, did you think about that? I love that phrase. If you were fruit in God's refrigerator, you'd have an expiration date on you. There'd be a moment where we look and go, ooh, they got sour. That's no longer good. Some of you are getting there sooner than others, right? Don't point at your neighbor. I saw that in the back row right there. Right? Yeah, listen, listen. Jesus always prioritizes the eternal over the temporary. Now, this is big because God has a priority list and we often miss it and we get frustrated because God doesn't follow our priority list. And this is how I kind of view it and how I understand it to work. Many of you know John Howard, Megan, who was just singing, our other pastor, all right? She was just singing and her husband works for uh, the fire department squad. Listen, John Howard never shows up at a scene, all right? Looks at the patient whose liver is like hanging out here in the car wreck, all right? He never looks at that and then goes, oh my gosh, she's got a cut on the stump. Come and get a band-aid! Right? That doesn't happen, right? Look, our people that are on the squad of the fire department are trained. The first thing you do is assess the situation, the environment, make sure everything's safe, and then you assess the patient's health. Like, what is the number one priority before we do anything to this patient? What is the worst thing going on? Our nurses and our medical people, you know this, right? You look and you go, hey, what is the first thing that we should do? And it is not, oh my gosh, there's a small cut on his thumb. Let's take care of that first. All right? Medical people who are caring for the health of people have a priority list. Jesus does the same thing, but he sees more than we see. He doesn't just look at the temporary and the physical. He sees the eternal, and he looks and says, the number one priority for this patient, his soul, his soul is riddled with sin and needs to be forgiven because the body, the body, the body is temporary. Now, I know this all too well, because just the other day, I got done working, and I jump out of the shower, and I'm drying off, and my wife turns, and I, I said to her, I said, dear, I got to be honest, for the first time in my life, I'm feeling really old. Now, I don't know about you, but some of you married because it was like heavenly bliss. I married because I needed someone to keep me humble. And my wife turned and looked at me, and she says, it's because you are. And I said, I love you too. And she said, you're not just old, you're slow now too. The body is falling apart. Here's the good news. When we die, we go to heaven, Jesus says, you get a new lottie dottie, we get a new body. We get a new body. And so when Jesus looks at us on earth, all right, it's not that he doesn't care. Don't get this wrong. Don't get this wrong. This is the place where people go too far and they jump off the cliff. See, I told you Jesus doesn't care about us here on earth. No, 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 no. That's not what the scripture's saying. It's just saying that Jesus has a priority list. And he always prioritizes the eternal over the temporary. Thank you. Jesus always prioritizes the eternal over the temporary the temporary. Now listen, listen. This is where people go, you see, you Christians, you have an easy out for everything. All right? Even at a funeral, you'll say, well, see, God healed them this way. God healed the eternal. You, you guys just have an easy out for everything. The reality of it is, someone may say that out of frustration, but here's what I want you to know. That's not our easy out. In fact, that's one of the main points of wrestling that we do with God. Because if you tell me that my saying, look, so-and-so died, and we're going to celebrate that. I have to wrestle with this fact. I have a God who could heal, but chose not to. Wow. Let me say that again. I serve and have a God who could have healed, but chose not to. For whatever reason. 
And that reason is beyond my comprehension. That reason is beyond my understanding. And I have all kinds of ideas and concepts around it. But at the end of the day, I have to go, I don't know the mind of God. I don't know the heavenly wars being raged right now. I don't get it. But I serve a God who could have healed but didn't. And so when I say to someone, look, my God is always concerned more about the eternal than the temporary. And I celebrate, even though God didn't do the earthly healing, that so-and-so is in heaven with God. That is not me giving an easy answer. So that is me saying, I am wrestling with the deity right now. Because I look at my God and go, I think you should have. And we have talked over and over again in the church that it's okay to be angry with God. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to say, this causes me to doubt. This causes me to go, I don't understand. This causes me to go, are you still here? This causes me to go, are you a good, just God? And when I look at the situation, it's okay to go, I don't get it. So it's not an easy answer. It is the truthful answer because we know the truth in spite of how we feel. Let me say that again. We know the truth in spite of how we feel that this person received the eternal healing even though we missed the temporary physical healing. It is at this moment that we stand with Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. Abednego, sorry. And they have this amazing moment in Scripture that I just kind of, we kind of claimed as kind of this, this is part of our life verse here. And the story's like this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, three Jewish young boys, all right? Uh, they're taken captive, and they're in Babylon, and the king has set up this golden statue. And he made a law and said, if you don't bow down and worship the statue, I will throw you in a fiery furnace. Which, by the way, if I got to go, that's not my choice. Right? Anybody choosing fiery furnace? No. Okay, good. Uh, so that's, that's the subject, that's the issue, and the boys refuse to bow down and worship. And the king's upset, and he calls them in, and he's like, hey! There, Curly Moe, what's the deal? You're supposed to bow down. When you hear this music, you bow, bow down. Bow down to the statue. And, 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 and here's the response. Knowing that their life is at risk. I love this out of the book of Daniel. It says this, Shadrach replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves to you. Because the king goes, do you not understand I'm going to throw you in a fiery furnace and you will die? He said, we don't need to defend ourselves. Listen, listen. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. Don't miss that truth of the scripture. The God we serve is able. There is nothing that God can't do which makes our faith extremely complex, but it also makes it the only reasonable faith on earth. The God we serve is able to save us. But, they say, but, even if he does not, we want you to know, King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the images you have set up. Now, this is huge. This is huge. Because this is what we're ultimately saying in the faith, in the, excuse me, in the face of someone who says, your God's not real. We'll say, look, our God could have acted to heal. And I don't know why he didn't. But even though he did not, we will not turn our backs on God. Because just because God doesn't do what we don't want it, what we, what we wanted him to do, when we wanted him to do it, how we wanted him to do it, doesn't mean that God's not real. Doesn't mean that God doesn't care. Doesn't mean that God ceased to be good. And I don't have any answers beyond that. It just means that we'll continue to serve God. He's not Santa Claus. Just because I didn't get the toy I wanted at Christmas doesn't mean I'm suddenly going to go, see, I stopped believing you. Ha! Our story in Luke goes on. It says this. Excuse me. Jesus is wrestling with the Pharisees. And they say, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can for, what, watch this, watch this. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now this is fascinating because normally when I just read through the story, I don't get this part. But this is what the story is all about. Who can forgive sins? They say, but God alone, Jesus just walked over and said, look, instead of healing you, your sins are forgiven. And everybody in the room went, oh. 
oh, 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 no, he did not. You, 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 you can't do that, Jesus. Look, you can't forgive sins. There's only one person who can forgive sins. There's only one person who can forgive sins. It's not my dog. It's not my doctor. It's not my banker. It's not even my spouse. The only person who can forgive sins is, if you said God, you get two points this morning. Those of you that didn't, you get smacked upside the head. There you go. Now listen, listen, listen. This is the point of the story that we often overlook. This is the point of the story that we often overlook. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Listen, there are people out there, and there are worldviews and religions that want to tell you, look, Jesus didn't even think he was God. Jesus didn't know he was God. Jesus didn't understand that he was God. Jesus never claimed to be God. They've obviously never read the scriptures. Because you can make absurd statements about Jesus, but the one thing you can never say is that he didn't think he was God or didn't believe that he was God, didn't proclaim he was God. Jesus says, look, I forgive your sins. And everybody goes, oh, that's blasphemy. And they have the right to now take him out and stone him, to kill him, to toss him off a cliff. And Jesus turns to them and says this. Excuse me. Jesus turns to them and says, listen, listen, listen. As the teachers in, of the law were saying, hey, who, can, who can do this? Jesus turns to them and says, look, what is easier to say? And why do you think these things in your heart? What is easier to say? Sin, your, 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 your sins are forgiven? Or get up and take up your mat and walk. And then he says, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority to do both. And then he says, take up your mat and go home. Jesus has just made a statement that he is, which leads us to math with Jesus. Da, 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 da. My brother's going to love this. Ready? Here's the equation. A is only God can forgive sins. Right? Then B, Jesus just forgave sins. If A plus B are true, therefore equals Jesus what? Yeah, do you see that? Jesus clearly makes a statement. I am God. I have the authority to do so. And then he proves that he has the authority to do so by telling the man, you know what, just so everybody's clear, get your mat and get out of here. Get your mat and get out of here. Now listen, 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 listen. This is the place where we really wrestle with God then. You see, we say, well, then what was the mission of Jesus? Why did he come at all? Because Jesus says, look, my mission wasn't to save you from earthly troubles. It wasn't to free the world from, from hunger or physical pains. The mission wasn't to end all war and suffering. The mission of Jesus was to come and save us from sin. We defined sin for you a couple weeks ago. We made a big deal about it. That In our culture, the world no longer hears the word sin and goes, oh yeah, I'm a sinner, I need Jesus. The world hears the word sin and goes, I'm a terrible, evil person, right? And then we go to conversations we don't want to have or usually the conversation ends. And so we were helping us redefine sin as a violation of our purpose. God's created purpose for you was to give him glory. But we've all sinned, right? We've all said, God, I'm not giving you glory here. Whether we did it intentionally or we just said, hey, that looks like more fun than what God wants for me. And so we've all sinned. And Jesus Christ came and gave his life for our sins. This is why we read Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 has an amazing scripture where Jesus says, look, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Some of you memorize the Lord's Prayer. We say this sometimes, depending on which version you say. Uh, forgive us our transgressions as we forgive those who transgressed against us. Or some of you have a different version. You say, forgive us our debt as we forgive those who have debted against us. Here's what I want you to know. That transgression word, or debt word, it is those who have sinned. Forgive us our violations of our purpose. 
forgive us the violations of our purpose. It says he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. The punishment. The punishment was on him. Now we, we in church, we don't often like to use these words or these phrases or even go to this concept. Because we, we kind of pendulum swing from about 100 years ago when we had all kinds of language and sermons and everybody was going to hell and God was angry with everybody and we used to turn the heat up in the room to about 110. That way when you left church, you knew that you didn't want to go to hell because you already had a taste of it. Right? Some of you have been there, right? And some of you have even been to churches now where they still do that. God is just angry and he's furious and the pastor stands there and he shouts and he's there to hit things and his hair's on fire and it's just crazy, right? And you leave that church going, I am the worst person in the world. Or you leave that church going, that is a crazy place. I never want to go back. If that's what God's like, we're not going to heaven because God's pretty ticked. And so we don't like to talk about the punishment or the anger of God. Here's what I want you to know. Listen, listen. God hates sin. You can't understand this passage or what Jesus did on the cross if we don't understand that God hates sin. Now listen, 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 listen very carefully because this is, this is the part we often miss. We go, God hates sin, therefore he hates sinners. That's not what I said. That's not what scripture reveals. God hates sin but loves sinners. Well, Aaron, I don't know how you, I don't know how you split that. I don't, aren't you just splitting hairs? I mean, you can't hate sin, but love the sin. I mean, people who commit sin, I mean, they're sinners, right? No, 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 listen, listen, listen. A couple months ago, I had a mom in my office, and she was just a mess. And I'm talking with her, and, and I finally get her to calm down and stop sobbing. And she's telling me about her daughter, grown daughter, got kids, hooked on heroin. And you know what a terrible disease that is. And I call it a disease because it, it is something that affects you in ways as a drug that, that's just brutal and gruesome. And barring some kind of a, amazing help and the intervention of the Holy Spirit, it is almost impossible to get off of. And she's talking about how her daughter injects herself and how she, she doesn't take care of her kids. And that mom is sobbing and asking for prayers and wondering if there's anything we can do for help. And we try to help her find some resources. And, and, and here's what she finally turns to me. She says, I just hate heroin. And all I can do is say amen. Now listen, that mother is in my office because she absolutely loves her daughter. She understands that her daughter is not right in the head. She understands that her daughter is, is, is making choices but is hooked, right? That the disease, the drug has got her. It's not her daughter that she hates. She doesn't like her choices, but she doesn't hate her daughter. She's in my office because she loves her daughter. She's doing everything she can. And she's finally said, I got to go to the church and to find a pastor I don't even know to pray for my daughter. This is the only thing that I can think will work if God doesn't intervene. great, great illustration for how God hates sin, but still she loved her daughter, hated heroin hated everything heroin did to her hated the fact that, that, that there's this culture around here, hated all of that, but still loved her daughter, God hates sin but still loves you and I as sinners the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. By his wounds, we are healed. Now, I've spent the last two, three weeks trying to go, how do I explain this really quickly in a way that, that I think everybody gets it? And, and you know, I don't use video clips very often, but, but as I was online kind of looking for other ways that someone explained it, the guy who did Veggie Tales, which we all know Veggie Tales, right? The guy who did Veggie Tales did a much better job than I can do with it. He's created a new series that explains scripture. And so v Phil Visker uh, put this together, and, and I just thought it, was, I thought it was good enough to explain how God takes the anger and the stain of sin upon Jesus on the cross. And so I just want to 
quickly. Let somebody else who explains it better than I can I'll show you a clip about it. Oh, good question. What about that? What about sin? This is the most amazing part. The people around Jesus just saw a man dying on a cross, but that's not what God saw. God saw something very different happening. God saw his son, the son of God, on a cross. Then he saw the stain of our sin appearing on Jesus. Your sin, my sin, everything selfish and mean we've ever done or ever could do. The stain of all that sin was appearing on Jesus, even though he'd never done anything wrong at all. God saw his son stained with all the sin of the world. He saw him buried under all that sin. He saw him die under all that sin. And since the punishment for all that sin is death, death away from God, that's how Jesus died, alone, away from God. The last thing Jesus said was, God, God, why have you left me alone? But if he died, how can we say Jesus has power over death? because he didn't stay dead. Amen? I know that was awesome. I understand that Jesus took upon himself the anger of God, the stain of sin. Upon the cross, that which we deserve, Jesus said, I will take it because, not because I don't care, but because I care so much, I'm willing to die for you. I didn't come to end human suffering. I didn't come to end wars. I didn't come to end famine. And listen, listen, this is the part where we go back in the story and go, oh, we, we don't want to miss the most important part. Because not just anybody could do this. Only one person in all of history, God, who became a human through Jesus Christ, took upon himself our sins on the cross. Because the eternal is always prioritized over the temporal. Listen, listen, this is why we came to church today. Did you know that? Yeah. This is why we came to church, because we come to church so that we can be reminded of what we need to remember. Right? We came to church because there are days in my life where I become so self-efficient, and I start to go, you know what, I, I'm a pretty good person. And the reality of it is, when I hear this message, suddenly I go, oh, I'm not such a good person. I need Jesus. Because the reality of it is, if I start thinking like I'm a good person and my good works or something that I do gets me into heaven, then I'm missing the mark. And then suddenly, and suddenly the weight of the world is on my shoulders because I go, I got to keep being at this level. And then we hear the gospel message that says, it doesn't matter what level of goodness you're at. Jesus died for your sins. It's not about how good you are. It's about do you believe in the eternal healing? that is prioritized over the physical. If you believe that, then your relationship with God is restored because your sins were placed upon Jesus on the cross. We came to church this morning to be reminded that life isn't about me. It's about my faith in Jesus Christ and that there is a healing of sin that is far greater and more important than any physical healing that can take place. Now that's not to, again, answer all the questions. But this morning, as we intro a sermon series about the healing, we can't talk about any of the physical healings without understanding that God first prioritizes the spiritual over the physical we can't have a conversation about why did or did not God act over here until we understand that Jesus first and foremost didn't come to end human suffering but came to die on the cross as God's son for us. This is the place that all healing starts. Amen. In Jesus' name may you go forth in the mystery of God that not all physical healings happen the way we want them to. But praise God there is the